Denver prepares more budget cuts to pay for the migrant crisis. Police, the animal shelter, even elections could be impacted. Bracing for a long and loud night in Lakewood as the city fends off anger from false claims that Lakewood is about to house thousands of migrants. Excel realizes it is overcharging customers, but won't automatically fix it because that would hurt the company's bottom line at a time when it's bringing in record profits. I think it's very clear we've got a problem here. We've, we've got a really significant problem here. And we remember a man who helped to make more of Colorado accessible to more Coloradans. Tonight on Next. We've learned that the city of Denver's proposed budget cuts to fund the migrant crisis are likely to hit across the board, including the police department. The animal shelter could even impact elections funding. Here's Mark Salinger with that. In a critical 2024 election year, the Denver Clerk and Recorder's Office says Mayor Mike Johnston has asked to cut nearly a million dollars from the department that oversees elections. The money, they say, is needed to help pay for the migrant crisis. Down the street at the police department, DPD tells us they're working on finding places to cut their budget. So is the Department of Public Safety and the Animal Shelter and the Health Department. Every agency in Denver finding ways to cut its budget for the same reason. We want to talk about two of those today. While they're the first steps, they unfortunately will not be the last and may not be the hardest. Last Friday, Johnston announced publicly the first two cuts, $5 million from the DMV and Parks and Rec. Now we know a little more about what he was alluding to when he says more cuts are coming. We have asked departments to go out and take a look at how they would make budget reductions. The Denver District Attorney's Office says they've been asked to cut their 2024 budget by 5%. The Department of General Services says they're looking to cut by 15%. Even the Department of Human Services, which is leading the efforts to help migrants, has already diverted $15 million from other projects towards the crisis and is looking for even more ways to cut money. This is a plan for shared sacrifice. This is what good people do in hard situations as you try to manage a way to serve all of your values. Even the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, which is responsible for everything from trash pickup to potholes, may soon have to cut funding. Every agency in the city. We don't yet know how much funding a lot of these departments will be forced to cut from their budgets. Our understanding is that the departments submit proposals to the mayor's office, which will then make decisions over the coming weeks and months on what spending to cut and where. Kyle Johnson has said that the city needs to find $180 million. And given the fact that public safety makes up such a large part of the city budget, you would think that, you know, a good chunk of money would come from there, except for the potential political risk exactly. of cutting from public safety while you have the influx of people in town. Yeah, Denver Police and the Public Safety Department, neither will tell us exactly how much they're looking to cut. Denver Police said that they're trying to make cuts in places that don't impact services for people who call the police department, for example. We don't yet know what that means, though. Yeah, it's going to be one of those where we're going to want to ask a lot of questions and see a lot of follow-up about exactly what is being cut. Because, exactly. you know, cutting public safety doesn't necessarily mean, like, laying off police officers or something like that. We want to know exactly what it entails. Mark, thank you very much. Lakewood is preparing for a contentious city council meeting tonight after conservative leaders in town spread false claims that Lakewood is planning to house thousands of migrants from Denver in empty school buildings. They're not. An anti-migrant group packed a town hall meeting last week when it advertised those claims, and they even managed to get their claims echoed on Fox News Channel. Lakewood's leaders say they are not discussing declaring Lakewood a sanctuary city, as this group has claimed, or housing migrants from Denver. Jeff Coe schools in the city of Denver tell us there have not been any conversations about using schools in Lakewood for migrant housing. Organizers of the anti-migrant group would not provide any evidence of their claims. Tonight, Lakewood city manager will review her recent meeting with Denver leaders. Lakewood says that all Denver asked for in that meeting is that Lakewood refer any migrants or any volunteers to existing resources in Denver. Lakewood's preparing for an overflow crowd at this council meeting we could total in the hundreds tonight. XL Energy is overcharging 17,000 business customers to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. But Excel isn't going to stop unless those businesses ask them. Our Marshall Zellinger explains. I think it's very 
clear we've got a problem here. We've got a really significant problem here. Not the kind of statement you want to hear from a public utilities commissioner. Megan Gilman, one of Colorado's three PUC commissioners, is concerned about this data. Data that shows, when added together, more than 17,000 of Excel's business customers are overpaying $32 million. And they wouldn't even have to turn off a light switch to pay less for electricity. They're just on the wrong type of billing for their electric usage. Here's why. There's something called Schedule C. That's the type of billing for businesses with smaller electric loads, like a law firm or a bookstore. In the winter, they pay four cents per kilowatt hour. There's also something called Schedule SG for businesses with larger electric loads, like a big box store or car dealership. They are charged very low for the actual electricity they use, less than a penny per kilowatt hour, but higher charges elsewhere on their bill. Over 60% of the customers listed in the SG class do not need to be on the SG rate. The vast majority of them would benefit significantly financially. Based on the data provided to the PUC, 17,000 businesses that are on the SG charges could save $32 million total simply by switching how they're billed, not even changing how much they use. Excel has emailed at least 14,000 of the customers to let them know they could benefit from a billing change, but it's on the business to make the change happen. Here's the rub for all of us. If these businesses start switching to the more beneficial rate for them, and they save money, but it does nothing for the system in terms of conservation, Excel, in a future rate case, could try to collect more money from all customers to make up for the costs of the infrastructure that it told the PUC, hey, here are our previous costs, here are our future costs, here's our bottom line, here's how we're going to divvy it up. That's how they got to these numbers that people are charged. And so if people start jumping from over here to over here, Excel's, they call it revenue erosion. Even though it's overpaying to somebody, Excel sees it as you're taking away from our revenue. Essentially, Excel's gotten permission from state regulators to go out and recoup those costs yes. from somebody. So if these businesses that are being overcharged kind of right-size their bills, the money's just going to come from somebody else. From a future rate case, and we keep talking, this is the electric rate case. Last week or the week before, we were talking about a gas rate case. So yes, the next electric rate case that we're talking about in a year or two will be some of this money, perhaps. What do they call it? Revenue erosion? Erosion. I, yeah. But parents of teenagers know what it's like to have revenue erosion in a household. All right, Marshall, thank you. Denver is going to continue to be able to sweep homeless encampments in the freezing cold. Because while a majority on city council oppose those sweeps, not enough on city council to overcome Mayor Johnston's first veto. Homeless advocates and doctors have been saying that sweeping homeless encampments during freezing weather can lead to deaths if people get separated from their gear. The mayor says the city doesn't plan to do large sweeps in freezing weather unless there's open shelter space. The thrust of the mayor's letter is that... Um, Removing of, removal of people from their shelters uh, during cold weather should be rare during his administration. We've just been collecting examples of um, people who have experienced being swept when it was cold outside, and that could be under a lot of different city authorities. Not one vote changed from the original 7-6 margin, so the veto override failed. The mayor's office has signaled a willingness to open new severe weather shelters when temperatures dip below freezing. And Denver's currently testing out a 24-7 model in warmer temperatures at the Coliseum this week. Colorado's public defenders can't work because a data breach has them locked out of their online systems. This could mean major delays for the courts. A spokesperson, a spokesperson says that the state public, health, the public defender's office had to disable their computer system after some of their info was encrypted by malware late last week. That leaves the attorney shut out of everything from email to court filing systems to online police records. Today, public defenders had to ask judges to postpone their cases. They didn't know the number offhand. And those cases could be delayed for weeks or even months. The state says it doesn't know when that system will be restored. Colorado's presidential primary ballots hit the mail this week, and there is potential for bipartisan confusion. A lot of layers to this. Of course, there's the situation involving Donald Trump. His name is on the Republican ballot while the U.S. Supreme Court considers whether to reverse the state Supreme Court decision that he's ineligible for office. If the Supreme Court finds that Trump is not eligible for office, votes for him will not count. Now, that is a highly unlikely outcome based on the skepticism we heard from nearly all of the justices in court last week. 
the majority of the Republican field listed on Colorado's Republican ballot has already dropped out of the race, but Colorado still considers them candidates. Remember these guys? Vivek Ramaswamy, Asa Hutchinson, nobody remembers him, Ron DeSantis, Chris Christie, they've all suspended their campaigns, but the Secretary of State's office says they didn't file a formal withdrawal, so they're on the ballot. And if they don't file that paperwork by March 5th, votes for them still count. Now to the Dems. People voting in the Democratic primary can basically pick none of the above this year. Democratic Party decided to include a non-committed delegate option on their ballots. If that option gets more than 15 percent of the vote, some of the party's delegates can back any candidate at the national nominating convention. And just a reminder again, if you're new to our open primary system, Colorado's unaffiliated voters, largest voting bloc in the state, will get both a Republican and a Democratic ballot in the mail. You can only return one or none. The latest nonprofit, Touched by your kindness and generosity is Sunshine Home Share, the folks who connect seniors who want to stay in their homes but need help with younger people looking for affordable housing. Including the donations from all of you who have signed up for our monthly giving to the Word of Thanks Fund, you have raised well more than $10,000 to support their work. If you know of a nonprofit that could use the community's help, email me at next at 9news.com. We sued RTD three different times, um, and as someone who uses that system, you know, I'm grateful every time I get on a bus or get on a light rail train. We remember a man whose life's work was making Colorado more accessible. Combating our health care crisis by helping to fund a new medical school in northern Colorado. And it has taken more than a year of cleaning, but the RTD station in Boulder is now meth-free. State legislators want to fight a health care worker shortage by funding the expansion of medical schools around the state. Today, the governor and a bipartisan group of lawmakers announced a proposal to invest in a new osteopathic medical college at the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley. It would be the state's third medical school, churn out an estimated 150 graduates a year. UNC estimates the project would cost $132 million. The upcoming bill to fund that would also help expand existing medical and vet programs at MSU Denver, Trinidad State, and Colorado State University. Lawmakers haven't said how much funding will be available, and of course that bill still has to make it through the state legislature. The RTD station in downtown Boulder is reopening next week after being shut down for more than a year due to meth contamination. RTD closed the lobby of the station last year after they found high levels of methamphetamine residue in and around the bathrooms. Originally, the plan was just to clean the air ducts. RTD says that ended up being too difficult. They had to pull out the ductwork and replace it. RTD added additional exhaust fans in the restroom, and they hope that that setup will help them contain and clean up any future contamination that happens. After a snowy weekend around here, Kathy Sabin's in with a look ahead. A beautiful start to the week, Kyle, with sunshine and 50 degrees, good travel weather, I-25 and I-70, no issues. And that will be the case as we move into Wednesday and Thursday, but things change once again at the end of the week. Our high temperature today at 52 for Denver is above average, and that is a trend that we'll enjoy for the majority of this week. But Friday, we have a storm and chance for snow, maybe accumulating snow right here in Denver. Not tonight and not tomorrow. Northwest flow aloft, transporting in a few high clouds, the big weather story continues to be center of circulation near Memphis that's lifting into the northeast, and that will become a nor'easter with about 20 million people under a winter storm watch in and around New York City. We are dry and mild here until Thursday with a little mountain snow on the way to freshen up the snowpack. High clouds will move through tonight and again tomorrow, but really just a nice start to the day. Temperatures this evening in the 40s will drop 10 degrees by 10 o'clock, and your extended forecast includes above average temperatures and lots of sunshine for Tuesday and for Valentine's Day. The possibility of an overnight rain or snow mix Thursday night. Friday will be the coldest day of the week with highs in the 30s and some light snow. But the storm moves out. We're back to sunshine in 50s by Sunday and Monday. So a real profound sense of gratitude as a person with a disability, knowing that there's so many things that he did that make my life better. And his legacy lives on if you know where to look. Kevin Williams worked tirelessly to improve the lives of Coloradans with disabilities. An attorney who used the law to open up stores, restaurants, public transportation. 
He passed away last Thursday after a short illness. You know, he definitely had that, like, lawyer exterior, but he was a very caring person and, again, very funny, very, um, really great dry sense of humor, um, very, very smart. My name is Julie Riskin, and I am the co-executive director of the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. We are a statewide disability-led organization, and our mission is very broad. It's to advocate for social justice for people with all types of disabilities, and that's what cross-disability means. So Kevin actually founded our legal program. It's a civil rights legal program, and it was created to make sure that people with disabilities had a way to enforce our own rights. Most people with disabilities are very low income. We're the poorest demographic in the country. And so without people like Kevin and without programs like this, there was no one to enforce our laws. He lived with a disability himself so he his passion came from both his lived experience and that of and the lived experience of his clients he did a lot of work to make public transit accessible he dealt with um, a lot of cases for people who are deaf so anyone who you know uses any of the you know red rocks fiddler's green you know any of the big stadiums downtown he he had impact on all of them he, he worked with a lot of disabilities and and really was very much bought into the, the cross disability belief that we have to have access for everyone it can't just be for one group or another it has to be for all of us we absolutely can live great lives and kevin was a an example of that you know he had a great career you know had the kind of job that he liked doing you know, made a difference really helped people lost to our community and wanting to make sure that the work that he started will carry on because that's what he would want. His colleagues tell us that Williams started off as a plaintiff in a lot of the cases that he worked on, advocating for his own rights and then bringing the rest of the community into the fight with him. Big stack of your feedback about Denver's migrant crisis and the response. We'll delve into that next. A four-legged traffic jam is the most Colorado thing we saw today. Viewer named Carrie sent us a video from Berthet Pass. That is the Moose Lane. If you're not familiar, left lane is the Moose Lane. Right lane is the car lane. Please just proceed carefully. If you're not a moose in particular, if you see something that says Colorado to you, email next at 9news.com. Feedback about the migrant crisis and the way it's impacting our communities. This via text is regarding the Lakewood story. Speak plainly. The conservatives did not spread false claims. This texture says they spread lies. For us to call something a lie here, we have to know that the people know that it's false, right? There has to be that intent to deceive. In my conversations with the organizers of the event, the anti-migrant event in Lakewood, they wouldn't provide any evidence of their claims, but I don't have any evidence that they knew that it was made up. Does that make sense? And it's kind of a fine line, but that's, that's where we come down on it. Cheryl writes in about the situation in Denver. Question about uh, budget cuts. How much of a salary cut are Mayor Johnston and city council taking? So, Cheryl, I don't know of any city workers at all or any elected officials who are giving back salary or taking a salary cut as a result. And Aubrey says, uh, it sounds like you have a cold. If so, I hope you get better soon. Uh, Aubrey, thank you. Uh, it is not only just a cold, it's a man cold, so symptoms include whining, drama, and exaggeration. 